databases. You will run into these in various ways. Uh, as we talked about before, when you're doing this stuff in a research context, uh, figuring out what to save so that you can then assess whatever your goal is, is super important, right? So there's this piece of product or project design that's really important to think about. If you're trying to figure out whether people are more likely to use this web app the way you've made it, you need to figure out what instruments you need to put into place in the software to actually assess that later on, in addition to whatever qualitative metrics you're using. If you're running an experiment, you make sure you're gathering data at the right time. All that stuff is just about project design and research design, right? So I'm going to assume that you sort of are at the point where, or that that's going to happen separate from the conversation about storing that data, okay? So I'm not going to talk about sort of the research study design around making sure that you've got the right data you need to answer the questions, because that's a whole other can of worms, um, which I'm happy to talk about, but I think isn't within scope for this. So assuming that you know the data storage or the data that you have, and whether it's coming from a mobile app or from you know, some custom hardware that you've made, you are going to eventually want to get it into a database that you can open up from a desktop computer, because that's going to be the way you analyze stuff. Um, so what I want to talk about is the way you model that storage and the smart ways to try to think about accessing it. Okay? Uh, so before we can start that, we have to think a little bit about history. Uh, so historically, they started off storing data in these linked lists that we talked about a while ago, right? You would have one data set and a pointer to another piece of data and a pointer to another piece of data. And that was a big pain in the rear. Um, so then they started using these sort of disk-based storage mechanisms where uh, you would basically know that if you wanted to look something up, it was around here on the hard drive and something else was around here on the hard drive. And then they quickly realized that that was a pain in the rear, so they moved to generic relational storage. So for a long time, this relational modeling has been the standard way that people store data. This has been, you know, there's whole classes about ways to do this. There's like Sigma 6 certifications on how to do this modeling correctly. I'm not going to get into that too much, but it's important to be able to do this type of modeling because even though, uh, which we'll get to in a minute, non-relational databases are really popular right now, you want to make sure that if your problem really is a relational problem, it may make sense to store it in a relational database. So how many, have used, how many of you have used a relational database before at all? OK, so a handful. Um, how many of you have used a document database, a non-relational database at all? OK, great. So uh, what do I mean when I say relational modeling? Uh, I mean stuff like this, right? If you look at the Media Lab, you can think about the fact that a group has many people. And the flip side of that is that a person belongs to a group, right? A group has many projects, and the flip side is that a project belongs to one group. Um, and a person has many projects, and a project has many people. These are relations, right? That's why it's called relational modeling. Um, not that complicated, right? So what you do is you draw a diagram like this to get started, right? So making this list is the first important step, right? Defining the right objects in your system. I've defined group, person, and project. Right? as the three objects in my system. Right? That already took some thinking about what the right objects were. Um, so now I've defined those, and I've defined the relations between them. So then you move to a diagram like this, where you say, OK, I've got my objects, and I'm drawing lines between them to indicate how they're connected. Right? So uh, you read this by saying that uh, a group has many people, a person has many projects, a project has many people, and uh, a group has many projects. And for the purposes of this example, a project has one group. Right? So that's how you read sort of the simplest version of this diagram. So once you've got the right objects defined and the right relations defined, then you do something like that. Once you have this, it's a very short jump to start to mirror this into tables. Right? So basically, each object becomes a table. And I've put the table title, and I put some of the columns that I might need in each. Um, and this gets tricky, and, and you call these relations. Each one has a different name, right? So this relation, group to project, is a one to many, right? So we know group has many people. Things get complicated when you have a many to many relationship, right? So when people can have lots of different projects, and projects can have lots of different people. So I could be working on four projects, and any of those projects could have five different people, right? So at this point, what we've done is we've added an extra box, right? We've added in this membership box. This is called a link table. And what it does is it basically lets you, as you can see, it just references a person and a project. The whole point, the sort of the whole point of the, these relationships is that you normalize your data. So you're not repeating your data anywhere. 
right? So you could just store this in one big table where you had columns that said the people, the projects, and the groups. But then you'd have the person's name in a bunch of different places. So if the person needs to change it, you need to change it in a bunch of different places. That is a really bad idea, right? The point in, in this type of data storage is that you want any single sort of bit of data uh, to be in one place, right? So a person is going to have one row in the person table. Anywhere else you want to refer to that person, you use this magical ID, which is unique, right? So every row in every table gets a unique ID. Um, and that's the way to think about relational database tables, right? So no matter what, there's going to be an ID column in every table, and it will be unique in that table. And we call that a unique primary key. So this is the primary key. The ID is the primary key. And that's basically like how you look something up. It's the thing you know is unique no matter what. It's the magic number that lets you reference this anywhere you are. So each of these will have that. When you get a links table like this, you basically refer to the magic numbers in each of them, right? So this will only have those two columns. Now, people argue about whether this should also have an ID column or not. Um, I tend to include it just because it makes life easier knowing that I always have an ID column I can use. But people argue about that because, well, let's not get to why. People argue about it. Uh, I suggest, even though I didn't put it here, having an ID column uh, just because then you know that no matter what, every table, every Every row has an ID on it that's unique in that table, right? There'll be a number one here and a number one here, but there won't, there's, only number, there's only one number one in person. Um, the reason you do that is so that, oh yeah, right, so keys. The reason you do that is that, so that you can do stuff like this. Use these foreign keys, right? I said the ID was the primary key. So you've got the primary key in each of these. These are called foreign keys. Foreign keys are how you reference something from one table in another table, right? And the foreign idea is that it's, it's a key, but it's the key from a different table. It's not from my table. So the way that a person indicates what group they're in, in that table, is that they add a group ID column, right? And that'll have the ID of the group they're in, because it's a many to one relationship. It's a, sorry, it's a one, yeah. Uh, it's a many-to-one relationship. We know that a person is only going to have, in this case, one group. So we just add a column that puts the group ID in there. Okay? And over here, well, I didn't put them in this one. But over here, in project, we're going to have a group ID column. right? That will indicate what group this project's part of. Over here, we need to do this trick where we reference the two IDs together. We say, OK. I want to keep track of what person is associated with, with what project. So every, every time you're associated with a project, I'm going to add another row. Questions about this so far? Yes? So keys are IDs, or they map to IDs? Uh, a key, keys? yeah. So a key is actually, it's a great question. Um, so think about ID as the column name we're using. Think about key as sort of the hook to something, uh, to something unique. So like, we're using the ID here as a unique primary key. We're using project ID here as a foreign key. So we're going to use it to join things together. Um, so that's sort of a mediocre difference between the two. They're kind of, you could argue they're interchangeable, but like, an ID is almost always a key. Um, I think I use those interchangeably. Okay. Yeah. But it could be a foreign key instead of a primary, primary key. It, that, the second thing you said. Yeah. So a foreign, a foreign key means it's a, it's a key that's in a different table. It, it can be just one, right? This is a foreign key as well. Okay. Right? This is a primary key. That's a foreign key. That's a primary key, primary key, foreign key, foreign key. If we had group ID here, which we should, that would be a foreign key. Okay? So foreign means it's a key to a different table. Primary key means it's the key from my table. Once you've done this, then you can picture how you're able to ask questions. Like you can say, OK, um, give me a list of, of all the, um, I mean, simple questions like give me the list of all the people in this group. right? So how would you do that? You've got to find the group, join it with the person, and then filter it so you only get the groups that have a certain, the people that have a certain group ID. 
right? So when you ask questions like that that require you to combine across that relation between two objects in your system, those are called joins. So that's when you do a join between two tables. Um, you can join tons of different tables. And every join that you make has to specify how you join two things together. Right? So if you want to join, if you want to figure out a list of all the people and every project that they're on, then you've got to join the person table, the membership table, and the project table. You have to join these two based on this primary key and this foreign key. And you join these two based on this foreign key and this primary key. So that's a three table join. right? So every join, you have to indicate how you join it together. So if you want to join um, project in group, and there's group ID here, then you do a join on group ID is equal to that ID. Naming conventions help a lot here, which I'll get back to later. right? So knowing that, for instance, a foreign key always is table name underscore ID is really useful. Um, so that join is a key piece of this relational. Uh, relational modeling, the idea that you join things together across the relation by specifying the keys that you've used to indicate their connection. Okay? And that's really what relational modeling is. And you, we've moved from a very simple text, date, text description all the way to basically uh, our definition of our database. And that's called a schema. Okay? So the list of all the tables and columns and sort of what type they are. So uh, this has, a, has an integer, this holds a string, this holds a date time. You always have to tell it what it's holding. So the reason this is useful is that, um, is that there are standard ways to find stuff across relational databases. So basically, since this was sort of a normal solution that people said like, oh, this is useful, well, you're doing this, I'm doing this, let's agree upon a standard way to query this data to get data out of this. And that's how they came up with this language called SQL, which is something like structured query language or standard query language. So there's a standard another programming language for getting data out of SQL databases. So a relational database is often referred to as an SQL database. I think they're pretty much interchangeable. Postgres, MySQL, um, uh, these are all sort of, those are the two big open source ones. Um, SQLite. Uh, most of these have SQL in the name because they support SQL. Things sucked before they invented that because if you shift a database, you had to do a whole new way to get data in and out. At least right now, no matter what database you're using of relational databases, you pretty much have a standard way to get data in and a standard way to get data out. The problem is you don't want to learn another programming language. That's a pain in the rear, right? So you want to try to avoid that. So what does this let you do? It lets you find subsets of data based on criteria. So for instance, query for all the people in a group. Right? My criteria is the group ID. And then I want to get just the subset of people that are in that group. Uh, it lets you merge data in disparate tables. So that's using a join with a foreign key. And compute aggregate info. They, so they added in stuff like count to make it easier. So if you wanted to count the number of people in a group, you can use a special command called count with the same filter. Um, so uh, it works in a lot of database services, like I said, SQLite, MySQL, Postgres, MS SQL Server. Um, some of the assumptions I've already mentioned that make this work are things like this. Don't duplicate data. So for instance, don't have a name, someone's name in more than one place. Right? That should be in a person table or a user table uh, with a name column or a first name, last name column. And that should be the only place you can change their name. Um, uh, various parts of your data relate to each other. We talked about how to model it so that you can get these foreign key relations going across. Um, your metadata and schema. So the schema, I said, was a list of all the tables and the columns. You could also call that metadata. right? It's data about your data. Um, it describes your data. One assumption is that that doesn't change too often um, because that's a, a relatively costly thing to do, um, especially with large databases, uh, in terms of time and computing horsepower that can be costly to change your schema. So for instance, if you decide you want to add a column, not that big of a deal. If you decide that you need to move half of the columns from this table into a new table and leave half there, that's the kind of thing where it gets expensive. Um, so you want to make sure you model stuff well. It's not that it doesn't change. It's just you don't want it to change really a lot. Um, so this is the situation here is that you want to sort of, if your problem looks like this, then you say, oh, OK, this seems like I need a relational database. I have sort of well-defined data. I have good columns. Um, seems like maybe I have a relational problem. So I use a relational database to answer it. 
So like I was saying, um, you want to avoid writing SQL by hand, because you don't want to learn another programming language. And it's pain in the rear. Um, so you use an abstraction layer. Um, and you'll often call these like data abstraction layers. Um, so 